Well, hello again. Here we are ready to start our comparative analysis of organisms and their eight different functions. This first presentation is going to be about feeding and digestion in animals. From the tiny little insects that dine on our blood to the whales, one that you see here that feed on krill, plankton, and fish, all animals are heterotrophs that obtain nutrients and energy from other organisms. As you'll see in the coming slides, the adaptations for different styles of feeding make studying animals so cool and interesting. Like this whale. Look at that. That's amazing. So get your papers ready. Remember, wide right, skinny left, and I'll see you on the next slide. We've all heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Well, rephrased for animals, how you look and how you act depends on what and how you eat. But let's think about it in reverse. What and how you eat depends on how you look and act. To learn why this is true, let's look at the various ways animals obtain their food. Filter feeders, sometimes called suspension feeders, strain their food from the water in the same way that you use a skimmer to strain the leaves out of a pool. Yeah, I know those of you at the pool really love that job. These organisms have a variety of ways to get tiny krill, plankton, and small organisms out of the water. From sponges that trap tiny particles as they pass by in the water, to flamingos that strain water with their bills, to huge baleen whales straining tons of krill and plankton from the ocean. Detritivores feed on detritus, or decaying bits of plant and animal material, as well as bacteria, algae, and other microorganisms found in the soil. Most are land invertebrates, like the earthworm shown here, and roly-poly bugs. But some crustaceans, crustaceans, like the fiddler crab, are detritivores as well. So are sea stars and sea cucumbers but all have adaptations for picking up bits of organic litter. They're like the world's trash men. As we learned long ago, carnivores obtain nutrients by eating other animals, like this praying mantis shown here. What adaptations does it have that help it eat? What kind of mouth parts do you think it has? Kind of cool, I think. Herbivores obtain their nutrients by eating plants or plant parts, like this butterfly getting its nutrients from the nectar in flower. Does butterfly, butterfly have the same kind of mouth parts as the mantis? Shouldn't. And omnivores, like this coatamundi in the raccoon family, it consumes both plant and animal material. Coatis have a very keen sense of smell. You can kind of guess that with its nose. Its large snout helps it to find food, often hidden in the soil. So let's take a closer look at some of these adaptations. Who remembers the term symbiosis from earlier units? Some of you are going, oh, I heard the word, but I don't remember what it means. Okay, remember, symbiosis is a relationship between two organisms when at least one organism benefits. The other is either hurt, helped, or nothing happens to it. The organisms that are involved in the relationship are called symbionts. And some symbionts are what we call nutritional symbionts, meaning that they depend on the symbiotic relationship to meet their nutritional needs. There are two main types of nutritional symbionts. We're going to take a real quick look at them. Parasitic symbionts live within or on host tissue, feeding on blood, fluid, blood, tissue, or body fluids. Examples of these are fleas, roundworms, and mosquitoes. And there's a lot more, but that's just three. Parasitic symbionts are often responsible for causing some pretty serious diseases like malaria, encephalitis, and pediculosis in humans, but they can also damage livestock and crops. But remember, the parasite's goal is not to kill its host. It needs its host to meet its nutritional needs, but the host often does die 
because of, or sometimes dies because of the parasite. Another type of nutritional symbiont is called the mutualistic symbiont. In a mutualistic relationship, remember, both species benefit. So a mutualistic symbiont doesn't usually cause illness or disease. The host organism really cannot function without the symbiont because both of them benefit. Let's look at these examples. Algae lives with coral, and it lives on coral. Algae recycles nutrients and it helps coral lay down its calcium shell. Remember, algae's plant, so it's producing oxygen. Coral is an animal. It's using the oxygen that the algae produces, but the coral produces waste in the form of carbon dioxide that the algae uses, so it can make its food. And the coral also provides protection against algae-eating critters, so they both benefit. Animals can digest proteins pretty easily, but the cellulose that's found in plants, that's really, really hard to digest. Bacteria live in the gut of termites and other insects that eat wood, and they also live in the rumen or the digestive tract of hoofed animals like cows, llamas, and goats. Cellulose is broken down by the bacteria that live in those guts, and the nutrients are used by both the host and the bacteria. So everybody's happy and everybody benefits. Just as there are many ways for organisms to get food, there are many ways for them to digest or process nutrients as well. The simplest animals, like the sponge that you see here in this diagram, digest food inside specialized cells that release digestive enzymes and pass the nutrients from cell to cell by diffusion. This is called intracellular digestion. Intra meaning within, so intracellular means digestion that takes place within the cell. Pretty simple, pretty easy. The opposite of intracellular digestion or digestion within a cell is obviously extracellular digestion or digestion outside the cell. This is how digestion takes place in most complex animals. Food is broken down in a digestive system and then absorbed by the body. Cnidarian, such as a jellyfish or a sea anemone that you see here, have a gastrovascular cavity with a single opening through which they ingest food and expel wastes. You can see the gastrovascular cavity opening right there where the arrow is pointing in the sea anemone and right there in the jellyfish. And as we talked about in class, they envelop their, their food and they extrude their stomach, digest it, and then spit it back out. Many invertebrates and all vertebrates, however, digest food in a tube called a digestive tract pretty complicated name there. Digestive tract has two openings. Food enters through the mouth and waste leaves through the anus. Pretty easy. It's a one-way street. Okay, Here you can see these one-way digestive tracts of some examples. An earthworm, a grasshopper, and a bird. Our digestive tract is also very similar to these as well. These digestive tracts have specialized structures that disassemble food into the nutrients that the body can use. Stomach and intestine are two, and almost all organisms have that have a tract have stomach and intestine. But there are other structures like a crop, a gizzard, or a rumen that also help digest food in certain animals. You can see that the earthworm has a crop and a gizzard, and the grasshopper has a post gut and a mid gut and a hind gut and the bird has a crop and a gizzard as well. Hmm, I wonder what they do. All animals however secrete enzymes. We talked about those a little bit up there. Remember what enzymes are? Enzymes are those chemicals that speed up a reaction. Well in this case they chemically digest the food as the organs like the stomach mechanically digest the food. 
So we have something mashing it and something chemically breaking it down at the same time. But no matter how effective any digestive system is, there is always some indigestible waste. So these organisms expel this solid waste or feces through the anus at the other end of the digestive tract. Mouth parts and digestive systems have evolved many, many adaptations to the physical and chemical characteristics of different foods. So let's take a look at some of those. Some specialized mouth parts for carnivores, they're adapted to eating meat. The mandibles and maxilla of the praying mantis, which we saw eating the lizard earlier. The sharp teeth of the Tyrannosaurus. And the hooked beak of an eagle. All carnivores have sharp structures that are meant to capture, hold, and slice and dice its food into small pieces. These also can include, though, the long sticky tongue of a frog or an anteater. They can also include adapted jaw bones and muscles. Take a look at the different jaws in class. The alligator jaw is pretty spectacular, I think. Herbivores have mouth parts adapted to rasping, grinding, sucking, or getting liquids out of plants, specialized for eating plant material. Hummingbirds and aphids both use liquids found in plants for, to meet their nutritional needs, and they have mouth parts to get that liquid. Caterpillars have chewing mouth parts. They love to eat leaves. And mammals, like a horse, have incisors for tearing grass out and molars for grinding that plant material up. Even animals like snails and slugs have mouth parts that are designed to help them eat plant material. They have a, a tongue-like part to their mouth that acts like sandpaper and it rubs the, the leaf parts away. Digestive tracts, though, are specialized to help break down food chemically as well. All carnivorous animals have digestive enzymes to break down proteins found in meat. But no animal produces digestive enzymes that can break down the carbohydrate cellulose in plant tissue. Remember, cellulose is what makes a cell wall really stiff and hard. This is where the mutual symbi symbionts come in handy. One example is in cattle and other animals that are related to cows llamas, goats, things like that. There's a pouch-like extension of the esophagus. Remember that the esophagus is the tube that connects your stomach and your mouth? This, this extension is called the rumen. Symbiotic bacteria live in this organ and they digest the cellulose. The partially di digested plant material is then regurgitated back up into the cow's mouth and it's chewed again and re-swallowed, where the bacteria digest it some more, so as much of the nutrients that are in the cellulose as possible are released. This is called chewing a cud, and it often looks like kids that chew gum. Okay, looks like the cows chewing gum, chewing your cud. So what's next? Well, you know the drill. Draw a line across the bottom of your paper. Go back and look through your notes and write a summary at the bottom of your paper. Then in the left hand column, look at your notes again and write questions. Remember your level one, level two, and level three questions? What kind of questions do you think you might find on a quiz? What questions do you have? Is there something you're confused about? Write those down. Here's a few to think about while you're looking at your notes. What are some feeding adaptations of, er of herbivores, both mouth parts and digestive, and how do they help? What are some of the feeding adaptations of carnivores, and how do they help? What are symbionts, and how do they help or hurt? See you in class, guys. Don't forget, bring your notes. Quiz next week.